samples of the Benetti ships. This, coupled with a fortuitous absence of a strong wind, made the Benetti sitting ducks. The Romans went from ship to ship, and though the fighting was long and hard, the outcome was no longer in doubt. The whole of the Veneti navy was destroyed, and the tribal leaders on land, deprived of their supply line, were forced to surrender to Rome. Caesar now controlled almost the entire north coast of Gaul, but he was not content with stopping at the water's edge. Across the channel lay the mythical island of Britannia, which Caesar resolved to invade the following year, both to cut off the aid that had flowed from the island to the rebellious Belgae and the Veneti, but also to score a massive domestic political coup. Think of the headlines, Caesar conquers the ends of the earth. It has a nice ring to it. But before he could invade the ends of the earth, Caesar would be forced to engage in a less romantic, though arguably more important venture. And, as it would turn out, the Roman public was at least as impressed with Caesar for leading a Roman army into Germania as they were for his later invasion of Britain. In 55 BC, German tribes began crossing the Rhine River and running amok, often encouraged by the local Gauls, who hoped to stir up as much trouble for Rome as they could. Caesar was forced to put his British invasion on hold while he headed east to secure the border. What he immediately intuited was that the Germans would have no fear as long as they believed the Rhine was a magical barrier to Roman advancement. So Caesar decided to put lie to that particular myth. But understanding that the optics demanded something altogether more spectacular than crossing his legionnaires on rickety boats, Caesar ordered a bridge to be built across the Great River. In what is widely acknowledged as one of the great feats in the history of military engineering, Caesar's army designed and built his bridge in just 10 days. Stable in the rushing water and strong enough to sustain the 40,000 troops Caesar intended to march into Germania, the bridge was an architectural masterpiece, but more importantly for Caesar's immediate concerns, it scared the bejesus out of the Germans. They had felt themselves completely safe on their side of the river, secure in the knowledge that the Romans, A, were afraid of invading Germania, B, would be easy targets if they tried to cross the river in boats, and C, couldn't build a bridge so fast that the Germans wouldn't be able to simply mass an army to meet the invaders. But in the time it took German scouts to notice the bridge and report it to their chiefs, the Romans were already hammering in the final nails. When the next round of scouts arrived to check the progress of the construction, they were forced to immediately turn around and report the unbelievable news that the Romans were already across the Rhine. The Germans panicked and retreated into the dense forest. Caesar spent three weeks marching around western Germany without encountering any resistance. Believing he had made his point, he ordered his troops back across the Rhine and the bridge burned. The Germans did not miss the point. Rome could go where it wanted, when it wanted, and it was best not to forget that fact. Despite the time he had spent on his detour into Germania, Caesar was determined to launch at least a preliminary expedition to Britain by the end of the year. So, with the autumn winds howling and winter fast approaching, Caesar set out with 80 ships to find out how much resistance he could expect if he decided to launch a full invasion, or if a full invasion would even be necessary. This first crossing can't really be described as anything but a debacle. Caesar had been unable to squeeze any decent information out of the local traders about where and when to land on the island, but what minimal scout work his own officers had done was totally inadequate. Not only did the Romans have no clue how to handle things like tides, but at every possible landing site they found themselves met by thousands of British warriors lining the cliffs. Finally, with great difficulty, Caesar was able to land his fleet and establish a small beachhead. But as soon as his ships were anchored, a storm swept in, smashing his fleet against the rocks. The beleaguered Caesar made contact with the local tribes and tried to put on a brave face, but it was obvious to anyone with eyes that the Romans posed no threat whatsoever. The local Britons indulged Caesar's pompous demands that they send hostages to secure the goodwill of Rome and return to their tribes, promising that, yeah, they'd get right on that. Caesar didn't even wait for them not to comply, generously agreeing to accept the hostages in Gaul. He patched up his fleet as fast as he could and sailed back to Gaul. Only two British tribes actually sent their promised hostages. 
The next spring, though, Caesar launched a far better planned invasion. The Romans never did get a handle on the tricky tides of the North Atlantic, but they were able to land without as much difficulty and establish a proper base. This time, Caesar arrived not with 80 ships, but 800 ships. The southern Britons were forced to take this threat a little more seriously, but they still proved to be a hard bunch to get a handle on. They all willingly agreed to submit to Rome, but took every opportunity to undermine the Roman presence and showed little stomach for the kind of real, actual submission the Romans were used to. The Britons seemed to be treating the Romans as little more than a temporary nuisance, shining on the invaders until they lost interest and went home. Caesar pressed inland and met with fiercer resistance, but primarily in the form of guerrilla attacks rather than open battle. Eventually, a Caesar learned who was directing the resistance and put their stronghold to siege. Failing to land a counterpunch on the Roman camp and draw Caesar away, the resistance ended and the besieged tribe agreed to recognize a king of Caesar's choosing. Anxious to get back to Gaul, Caesar left the islands in the hands of local allies. It would be another hundred years before Rome returned to fully incorporate Britannia as a province. The expedition had resulted in little material gain, but in terms of publicity, the invasion was a huge success for Caesar personally. There was nothing, it seemed, that the charismatic general could not do. Caesar returned to Gaul and settled in for a long winter. His heart was heavy with grief, and his mind was racked by dread at news he had received while he was in Britain. His daughter Julia had died in childbirth. The death of his only child affected the passionate Caesar mightily, but he further struggled with the implications this had on his alliance with Pompey. With Crassus in Syria, Pompey stood alone as the dominant triumvir in Rome, and now had nothing to bind his interest to Caesar's. But the sullen general did not have long to dwell on his grief or his political future. In northeast Gaul, a full legion was tricked out of their winter quarters by supposedly friendly locals, lured into a trap, and slaughtered to a man. But this was not news that Caesar would learn until after he got word that another camp was under siege by the same group, whose ranks now swelled with warriors from all over the country who wanted nothing more than to kill Romans. The besieged camp was led by one of Caesar's ablest commanders, Quintus Cicero, brother of the great orator. Quintus had not fallen for the ruse that had lured out the slaughtered legion from their camp, and despite the satisfaction of seeing through the trick, he was now surrounded by a rebel Gallic army and unable to get word through the line that he was under attack. Finally, a slave agreed to slip through and make contact with Caesar in exchange for his freedom. Once alerted, Caesar immediately charged out into the winter snows to relieve the besieged legion and arrived just in time. The sight of Caesar's army scattered the rebels, and Cicero's legion was saved. Nearly every soldier trapped inside the liberated camp had been wounded in some fashion or another, and Caesar praised them all to the hilt, handing out awards and honors left and right. It was not lost on these men, nor on the men who had done the liberating, that Caesar seemed to genuinely care about the average soldiers under his command. Throughout the campaign, Caesar famously referred to his men not as soldier, but as comrade. These simple acts of familiarity and compassion helped breed in his troops the fanatical loyalty that would prove decisive in the coming civil war. These men were never Roman legionaries, they were Caesar's legionaries. When the spring of 53 BC came, Caesar had one thing on his mind, revenge. He brought the full weight of his army down on northeast Gaul and engaged in a genocidal campaign against the tribes that were behind the assault on Cicero's men and, the Romans had later learned with horror, the murder of the tricked legion. Without remorse, Caesar slaughtered the men and sold the women and children into slavery. During this year in the field, Caesar also built a second bridge across the Rhine to halt aid and comfort that was coming in from Germania. He hoped to achieve not only a measure of revenge, but also signaled that Gaul was no longer a free country, and that any attack on Rome would be met with the swiftest and most brutal repercussions. In this, he was not entirely successful, as the brutality of 53 BC proved to those Gauls who still had fight in them that they had better do something now, or they would all wind up like their annihilated cousins in the north. 
But in a larger sense, the campaign was effective. It galvanized the last of the independent-minded Gauls, and when Caesar defeated them the following summer, all formal resistance was wiped out with them. But on the cusp of this great victory, Caesar's political fortunes in Rome were quickly spinning out of control. He had offered his grandniece Octavia, the sister of the future Caesar Augustus, to Pompey in marriage in an attempt to re-secure their alliance. But Pompey spurned the offer, and instead agreed to wed the daughter of one of Caesar's most hated enemies, a man named Quintus Metellus Scipio. This was not a good sign. On top of that, Marcus Crassus, long Caesar's benefactor, died fighting in a disastrous campaign in the east. The triumvirate was literally and figuratively dead. But there was no time to worry about domestic political concerns. In 52 BC, the last great battle of the Gallic Wars was set to be fought. Since he had arrived in Gaul five years earlier, Caesar had effectively used Gallic tribal rivalries to his advantage and avoided ever facing a united front. Now, though, with the noose finally closing around their necks, the Gauls joined forces under the banner of Vercingetorix, a Gallic king who would lead the last stand for his country's independence. I hope I'm not giving away the ending when I say that Vercingetorix would meet his end after being paraded through Rome in chains during Caesar's triumph. Cause of death? Unceremonious strangulation in a Roman jail cell. Prior to this ignoble end, however, he was the last best hope of the Gauls, and would cause as much grief to Caesar in one summer as the Roman tree. In the dead of winter, the Gallic king launched his rebellion by embarking on a scorched earth campaign. The Romans had been living off the land since their arrival, allowing them greater mobility and freedom from worries about protecting a supply line. Now, Bruce and Jeterix put as many towns and granaries as possible to the torch. It was cruel and punished his own people as much as it punished the Romans, but this was a time for desperate measures. He was persuaded, however, to spare Avaricum, the greatest city in southern Gaul, a decision he was uncomfortable with and would soon regret. Caesar gathered his scattered legions and headed straight for the great city. Despite assurances from the Gallic nobility that Avaricum was impregnable, Vercingetorix was forced to watch helplessly as the city fell after a brutal 30-day siege. Caesar's starving soldiers killed everyone in the city. Most importantly, they had secured enough food to see them through the next few weeks. The Gauls retreated, and as soon as he resupplied his army, Caesar followed. A series of feints and counterfeints finally saw the Romans chase the Gauls behind the walls of Dragovia. This time, however, overzealous Roman soldiers attacked too early despite Caesar's order to restrain themselves and blew the one chance they had to take the city. Forced to retreat after sustaining serious casualties, the Romans had more to worry about than simply licking their wounds. The defeat at Gergovia had broken the aura of invincibility surrounding Caesar, and the tribes across the country, including some of the most steadfast Roman supporters, flocked to Vercingetorix's banner. Caesar was facing the fight of his life. The whole country was now in revolt, and if he was forced to retreat to Roman territory, he was sure to be stripped of his command by enemies of the Senate. So, rather than fall back to the south, Caesar ordered his shocked troops to move north. At this desperate hour, Caesar caught one of his many lucky breaks. Engaging in a brief battle, little more than a skirmish, the Romans got the better of an attacking Gallic force. The defeat spooked Vercingetorix, and rather than staying